Welcome to the 227th Berlin Town Meeting. We are, we begin with a flag salute. This flag's over here, please join me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. <coughs> We are starting on page two with article 24, to elect a town moderator for the year ensuing. Is there any nominations? Thank you. In the exercise of discretion, I'll turn the, it over to Tour Nelson. Good morning. Are there any other nominations? Hearing none. All in favor of Paul Gillies as town moderator, indicate by saying aye. Aye. Uh, any opposed, say no. The ayes have it. Paul Gillies is elected town moderator. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it's my 18th year, and uh, I love this job. Uh, my job here is to get, well, help you decide what you need to do. We have a very short agenda today. Uh, but we also have other business, and I think we look forward to having uh, some talks about various things at that time. The first article, after the first article, is Article 25, and it says to hear the reports of the town officers for 2017. And this way I will go through the booklet. If you have one, you can follow along. And uh, if you have questions about any parts of it, uh, it should be addressed to the person who knows about it, uh, but uh, if we can't find, a, we'll, we'll try to find the answer to any questions you have. Last year's minutes show that there were no comments during this section, and so I'd like to see you get a little more involved this time if you can, but that's just a recommendation. Uh, so we have the select board report on pages eight uh, through 10, and uh, there, you, you may have read that. It uh, deals with uh, some of the issues. Any questions for the select board on this? Or does the select board want to say anything about it? No? OK. Uh, then we have the general ledger, which goes on for a while. And uh, then we have the, that goes to page 20. Any questions raised on that? Uh, the auditor's report, which uh, takes up most of the pages, from pages 21 through 71. Uh, we have the assessor's report on page 72. This is the person. Yes, Matt. Uh, so, uh, Matt, can you go, just going at, at the uh, auditor's report, um, I always learn that there's a page in there where the auditor has a letter that says if there are any problems or not. And I think I found it, and I think it said that there weren't any problems, but it would be great if a member of the select board just can. It looks to me like the report is on pages 70 and 71. I saw the same, but if, uh, Tori, can you have an opinion as to whether we're in complete sync with the auditing standards? Uh, that is correct. There were no findings this year. Um, Nothing that required a response from the uh, select board or changes to the, uh, it was a very good audit this year. We're, we're very proud of our staff and uh, uh, the job that they do, especially uh, Diane Isbell, the town treasurer. She's put a lot of good uh, processes in place to ensure the uh, internal controls. So assessor's report, page 72. Any questions on that? Uh, 73, the town clerk's report through 75, listing total births, deaths, and uh, other critical information. Uh, delinquent tax list on 76. Speak up if you don't, if you want me to slow down or stop somewhere. Uh, public works board, 77. Board of abatement, 78. Highway Department, 79, yes. 
quick question. The uh, highway department's report does a good job of covering the repairs and work that is done in the past year, but doesn't mention the plans for the upcoming year. I didn't know if the select board or the highway department could speak to what's planned for upcoming year. Who would be best to answer what we're going to do in the highways in the coming year? Does Jim want to? Tim? The question is, what are we going to do in the roads in the coming year? I don't think it would be comprehensive. What's that? Um, we got a paving project that we're putting in a bid for with the state of Vermont. We've done it for four years in a row now, and they have denied us the money because they don't have the funds. So that's one project that we have if we get the bid. And then we're just going to do some paving wherever we need it if we don't get the bid because we only have $150,000 to spend on paving. And I would like to do uh, a lot more graveling this year than what we have done in the past because it's paying off big time for the mud that we've had this year already. So that's a project. And then we got to put a bit of ditching and culvert work to be done. Good. Any other questions for Tim? Yes. So, okay. um, uh, I should, just before you go, I uh, made the mistake. Tim, you are not a resident of the town. No. Does anyone have any objection to anyone who wants to talk, as long as they identify themselves as a non-resident, to allow them to talk to us? If not, what? It depends. It depends? Okay. <laughs> Would you have any objection to Tim talking? Okay. Uh, who else, who is a non-resident here who might be speaking today? Don't raise your hand if you, yes, Bill, all right. Any objection to Bill speaking? And our state representative? Seems only fair. Okay, we're not going to worry about that again. Now, Matt. Thank you. Uh, can you tell us about the, the plan for Route 12 south of Montpelier, uh, the second phase of the project? Is it going to cross over into our town and the plans for Dog River Road and so on over the summer? Do you know anything? Can you tell us about that yet? Are talking about the city of Montpelier? No, the, the repaving of Route 12 from Montpelier uh, down. Last I heard that that wasn't on the schedule for this one. Okay. But that's the last I heard. Okay. <clears throat> Any other questions? Yep. Sure. Um, and to further uh, Mike's question, uh, one thing that's in the budget, or starting to be in the budget, not really addressed as part of the highway department budget, is we have two major culverts that need to be replaced, uh, one on Richardson Road and one on Mirror Lake Road. Um, these are both going to be major projects um, and expensive projects. Uh, we're, we're starting to set some money aside in the budget this year into the capital budget. Um, hopefully, we'll get some money from the state under the uh, Highway Structures Grants for both projects. Uh, but if, if we don't, uh, it's going to be a multi-year project to finance it. Plus, it can be working in uh, the Berlin Pond, which is a public water supply. So just the permitting on that alone from the state is going to take uh, some time. So uh, we have the engineering uh, contract out uh, for both projects. Uh, once we get the results back from that, give us a little better idea of what they're looking to do with those projects and give us an idea of what the final cost will be. Do we have a status of the uh, highways plan where they were going to close off this exit and, and its impact on any of our roads? Uh, yeah, VTrans uh, came to us maybe about two years ago now, I think, a year and a half, two years ago, uh, looking to do the, redo the bridges uh, there at exit seven. Uh, they came to us with a couple of different proposals. The first proposal was to route traffic on Crosstown Road to um, Payne Turnpike and to build a temporary uh, entrance to the interstate there by the Berlin Pond. Uh, that would involve uh, a lot of traffic along those roads, uh, you know, full-size tractor trailers, 
uh, the select board, and I think everybody was in agreement that was just not a viable option, uh, that the, the engineering and the increased traffic was just not a doable option. Uh, so the second uh, uh, proposal they had was to close the southbound exit 7 on-ramp uh, for a period of 21 days. And we felt that was a better alternative. That was our proposal back to VTrans. Um, you know, they indicated initially that that's the option they would go with. We've not heard anything more from them on that. That's still a couple years down the road. I think 2020, 2021 is sometimes these projects kind of slip back uh, before they're actually looking to do the work on that. Any more questions for the highway department? Thank you, Tim. Uh, Board of Abatement, page 78. I'll jump back a little bit. Zoning Administrator, 8081. Planning Commission, 90. Police Department, 83. Yes, Carl, 83 through 84. Hi, Carl Martin. Uh, I noticed or I understood last night at the pre-town meeting that uh, the town of Berlin Police Department lost a contract for security at CDH, um, and uh, that results in a loss of revenue as well for the police department, I understand. Was there any reduction in the size of the force with fewer duties involved because of the loss of the contract at CDH? That's my question. You want to answer? Short. <laughs> The um, police force did this as an addition to their normal duties, so there was no reduction in the police force. Um, it does make their day. They, some of the officers worked many, many hours. If you look in the employee salaries, you'll see some of the police officers had quite um, a yearly income, and that was due to all the time they spent in addition to their normal duties at the hospital. Um, we have a very good relationship with Central Vermont Medical Center. Um, it was the hospital's cost-cutting choice to uh, end the contract. Um, I think they felt badly to do that, and we certainly um, understand that. But no, the police force uh, was not reduced as a result of that. Other questions about the police report? Uh, there's a uh, town uh, employees list on 87 and 88, Cemetery Commission 89, Conservation Committee, Commission, Committee and Recreation Board, uh, Development Review Board, Emergency Management, and uh, web page. So beyond that, there are private organizations and uh, you can take up your concerns with them. I don't think, but there was a quite a, a good number of people last night at the pre-town meeting from the various uh, social services, and they it, that's really becoming quite the meeting to attend if you want, or maybe we should have it televised. But so uh, we're done with Article 25. One last chance to ask any town official any question on your minds. <coughs> Article 26, shall the town collect its real and personal property taxes to defray the expenses of the town for the period July 1, 2018 through June 30, 2019 in installments. One fourth of the tax is to be due by delivery or by U.S. Postal Service postmark, no private postal meter postmarks. On or before August 15, 2018, one fourth of the tax is due on or before November 15, 2018. One fourth of the taxes due are on before on or before February fifteenth, two thousand nineteen, and one fourth due on or before May fifteenth, two thousand nineteen, with an eight percent penalty and one percent interest per month or portion thereof to be charged for the late payment of any installment. Who will move that article so we may discuss it? Bob? And a second? Uh, any discussion? Yes. No? I saw a sign. No? Are you then ready for this question? I have to read it again. 
sorry, <laughs> shall the town collect its real and personal property taxes to defray the expenses of the town for the period July 1, 2018 through June 30, 2019 in installments. One fourth of the taxes to be due by delivery or by U.S. Postal Service postmark, no private postal meter postmarks. On or before August 15, 2018, one fourth of the taxes due on or before November 15, 2018, one fourth of the taxes due on or before February 15, 2019, and one fourth due on or before May 15, 2019, with an 8% penalty and a 1% interest per month or portion thereof to be charged for late payment of any installment. All those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. The article carries. <laughs> article 27. Shall the town of Berlin enter into a communications union district to be known as the Central Vermont Internet under provisions of 30 VSA Chapter 82? Who will move that article so we may discuss it? I will. Jeremy, and second, second. sir. Uh, why don't you start, sir? So, uh, hi everybody. Um, I don't know if you've seen the news coverage of, of this either on the radio or in the newspaper. I actually have a short presentation if you are interested in seeing that. Otherwise, I do have a shorter list of frequently asked questions <clears throat> uh, if you are so inclined. Um, do folks want me to give my, my full presentation? Yeah. I can. Bill, can I borrow your, your projector and screen there? Thank you very much. Gigabit, 
gigabit internet speeds would be about 100 times faster than a DSL connection and about 10 times faster than a cable modem connection for comparable prices. So this is a picture, this is actually, I didn't have an easy picture of, um, why, why did I include this? <laughs> okay, so that's Northfield, sorry. But you can see part of Berlin there anyway, so. The, the red lines, you can't see that very well, I apologize. The red lines are where there's at least cable infrastructure. So getting towards 21st century infrastructure. But all of the black rows are places, like my road, up closer to the pond. You can see the Berlin pond in kind of northeasternmost bit there. There's still a, a lot of central Vermont that doesn't even have the ability to get cable internet. So we're going to leapfrog all of that and go to essentially the fastest option that there is right now. And it's what's been the fastest option um, it's been being deployed all over the, all over the country not so much here in Vermont though so and this should say town meeting ballot this is left over from Montpelier but um, so what I'm asking of the 13 towns and cities is essentially just to trigger the statute to trigger the law that says we can create this district there's no money involved yet there's no anything involved yet this allows us to create a board and to start talking essentially the first paperwork step. So you'll see this, uh, Paul, Paul just read this, um, and this is what we'll be voting on shortly. Um, I want to reiterate the number of towns are totally insulated from the financial activities of the district. You can't use any tax money. The town's not going to be held liable for something bad happening. So you remember the Burlington Telecom fiasco when you had like late, late Monday night meetings and city councilors scrambling around and posturing and doing all sorts of wonderful things. I'm not interested in late in Monday night meetings at the Berlin Select Board. I wouldn't be voting for this if I thought that that was a possibility. I, I, I don't want that. That's not something that's going to happen with this setup. The statute was written specifically with that uh, budding fiasco in mind. Um, the, only, the only hook in here, this is, here's the downside. The statute says that each member of each town should make available some space that this district can use for the telecommunications equipment. So that could be essentially, will the town office host a, a router? And it, it, it might not even come to that. We have a server closet. We're talking about something the size of that projector, a small, like a desktop computer. That, that would be it. And they would be able to charge the district for that. It's not like they're going to be giving it away. Each town then appoints a board member in an alternate, and that's really it. So it's democratically controlled. It is a municipality. It's required to abide by open meetings, public records, all of these sorts of things like uh, the select board in Berlin has to. Um, so my, my motivation for this is that I heard, um, I don't know, is Jerry Diamantidis here by any chance? He's the, 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 the Berlin resident that kept kicking at me and kept pestering me and saying, this is something you gotta do. We gotta do this, we gotta move forward. He pounded me long enough and eventually, so eventually we moved forward with this, but the existing ISPs don't really have any plans to expand any farther than they already have. They've already picked the low hanging fruit and it's not profitable for them to expand any farther. But because we don't have a profit motive and because we can take advantage of municipal revenue bonds, we can do this more cheaply than the bigger for-profit folks can. Um, we will also um, uphold network neutrality, so no filtering or throttling of traffic that um, could be coming down the pipe from the, the bigger folks, and uh, won't be reselling subscriber, uh, subscriber behavior, subscriber data, because this is a public service. You wouldn't expect your, the sewer department to start thinking about different ways of adding revenue and profits. The job of this district will be to provide internet service, and that's, and that's it. Um, there's some good reasons to, uh, to support this for economic development purposes. Uh, telecommuters, Jerry Timontides, who lives down the street from me, oh man, who just walked in, I was just picking on you, Jerry, sorry. He, um, he telecommutes to Virginia, and there's a lot of things that he can't do, not to speak for him, but um, if you're a telecommuter, there's some things that you just can't do without a truly high-speed network connection. So he has DSL, I have DSL, and that's fine for watching Netflix, that's fine for being a it's more of a passive consumer of media. But if you're going to do actual office work, if you're going to try to upload videos, like I, I record videos for my students at Norwich, I recorded a 15 minute video and it took me three hours to upload it to, to 
YouTube. So I was up late into the night to make sure that it all made it over there and that my students could see it. Uh, Internet-based companies. A lot of small businesses start out as home businesses. So this really creates a possibility for legitimate internet-based companies to start here in Central Vermont. And then drawing people to Central Vermont. <clears throat> I, I, I make a joke to realtors sometimes in you know, groups when I'm talking about this, is that if you've ever gone on realtor.com, you see like three bedrooms, two baths, you know, 1,600 square feet. The next thing they're gonna add is the internet speed. So three bedrooms, two baths, 10 megabits per second. So there's a colleague of mine at Norwich who's trying to sell her house, but she's out in the far west fringes of Northfield, and then people come and see their house like, wow, this is exactly my price range. What's the internet speeds? And she sort of quietly looks down at the ground and shuffles her feet a little bit and says, wow. And then they don't come back. So people expect to be able to engage in the modern economy to be able to have modern internet access. So here are, here's where we are on the ballot. So we are right smack dab in the middle there. <clears throat> These are the 13 towns who are talking about this today or uh, in some form at other times. Very towns is actually in May. But they, they have an advantage. They get to see what the rest of us do before they can make a decision. And then I got some interest from Moortown and Elmore too. Um, it sounds like they want to be, they want to join after the fact. So this could, this could expand to cover nearly all of Washington County and even into a bit of orange down with Williamson out there, too. Oops. So some, some criticisms. I'm going to try to anticipate some of your questions. I don't want my taxes to go up for something I don't want, either. This is written into statute. Even if, the t even if the town of Worcester voted to give this district $10,000, it would be illegal for them to do so. The district could not accept that. I don't want to be in the same position as Burlington Telecom. Again, me either. The town is insulated from the activities of this district. And then here's what I, I, I do here. If there was truly the demand, wouldn't the market correct to provide the supply? So, um, no, it hasn't. It hasn't yet. Um, it hasn't corrected, and I'm I'm like two addresses down from places that do have cable, and, there's, and they say something along the lines of, well, find a bunch of neighbors and $10,000 and we can make this thing happen for you. Like, oh, because I have $10,000 lying around. So, but everybody essentially gets involved. Not that we have to pool resources initially or anything like that, but we work together and create this district. We, as a collective group of 13 towns, can actually make this happen. Um, aren't these towns covered by satellite and wireless broadband already? Probably. But those speeds are low. The amount of data that you can transfer in a given month is is capped. And it's not really effective for doing modern uh, home office stuff. So we are, uh, I'm just going to kind of skip down to number four. So. Actually, no, I'll skip to three. So, uh, supposing this gets approved in at least two towns, and I'm pretty confident that it'll get approved in all 13 towns, frankly. Um, each select board of city council is going to appoint a representative to the district. Roxbury's going to be on the same footing as Barry City, um, with a number of districts. It's not a portion by, by population at all. Um, throughout this, we're going to start talking about uh, uh, sources of seed money. We can't go to the bond bank unless we have some solid financials for so we're going to look for people to invest early. There are uh, anchor institutions who want, the, who want to be built up first and who are willing to put their money where their mouth is and help the community start this. Um, again, following the model of EC Fiber, who did exactly this, and after three years are uh, cash flow positive. Um, and then number five, the first annual meeting is May 8th. So all of these representatives would get together, we sit down and start doing the actual challenging work of figuring out how the district is organized, where we're going to start, um, who's going to do what work. And then um, we might consider adding additional members. So this would be where Elmore and Moortown and any other folks uh, have it or a member who have it might be interested. Um, looking at doing a feasibility study, where do we start first, where does it make the most sense? 
looking at uh, drafting a business plan, a budget, and then um, kind of filling in all the blanks. I mean, this is a, a small business that is a municipality, so we have a lot of unanswered questions still at this point. I have some ideas about how we proceed, but um, these are things that the, the board, the hopefully 13 member board, will ultimately be responsible for answering. And then everybody asks this question, so, great, 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 but when do I get past internet? So, at the earliest, I'm imagining, wherever we start, we'd be starting in probably 2020. We'd spend the rest of this year working out the kinks and getting the structure in place. We'd be working on getting the funding the following year, and then we'd look at the 2020 construction season to start running the wires along the utility poles and actually connecting people and getting stuff, getting stuff rolling. There's some language on the ballot that uh, Paul mentioned previously. <clears throat> so I'm going to tell you what my initial mission statement is for Central Vermont Internet. This is mine. This is not approved by anybody except for me. So I want to provide reasonably priced, high quality, community owned, ultra high speed internet access to all homes, businesses, and civic institutions in our member towns. And that's all I got for it. Questions for Jeremy? Well, Wait for the. Hi, um, Sandy Meyer Humper, and uh, you had talked about using a municipal bond. I just wanted to uh, confirm that that has no relationship with the town of Berlin at all. It has no relationship to the town of Berlin at all. These are these are slightly different bonds than what was used, for example, to renovate the school here. These are revenue bonds, which are borrowed in anticipation of the monthly membership fees. So knowing that there's this income coming in borrow in anticipation of that. They don't issue those unless you have two years of solid financials first. So we would still need some seed money for grants, donations, um, individual loans, in order to get things running on a smaller scale first before we can go and go to that possibility. I have, should mention that when you speak, you should give us your name so that the clerk can make sure she annotates your... Peter Burmeister. Uh, Jeremy, are you talking about servicing the entire town? Uh, initially, probably not. But in the long run, yes. In the long run, servicing all 13 of the towns. Every, every address, that's my, that's my vision, and that was EC Fire's vision when they um, connected or when they agreed to but all the 24 towns, their member towns, agreed to join the district. So I believe you're familiar with my road and my farm. And on that road, there are four buildings, all with DSL service right now. Three of those buildings belong to me. We're about a mile from Route 12. And about a quarter of a mile of that is the private road that I live on. And on the farm, most of the utilities, with one exception, telephone and electricity are underground. So how would that all play out? That's a terrific question. And the answer is, um, the, so, so the cheap answer is I don't know because I, because that's a decision of the board. However, I can tell you how EC Fiber does it. Um, the way EC Fiber does it is if there is an overhead line of no longer than 600 feet from the public right of way, um, they do the work for free. If it's farther than that, the costs would have to be borne at least partially by the resident. If there are underground runs and it is easy to run the fiber through existing conduit, if there's room in the existing conduit, it's, um, and it's of, again, 600 feet or less, um, we can pull it right through there without too much issue. Or we can provide the, provide the cable to you and you could pull it through, through the conduit. Otherwise, there would be, if there's additional trenching required or any additional construction required, that would have to be borne by the individual resident. Sure. So, Matt Levin. So, it, it seems like, this seems pretty simple, and it seems like, uh, I'll just say, it seems like a good idea. The, the approval of the town, since we have basically no liabilities or responsibilities beyond having someone on the board, so why is it sort of a technicality that the town has to approve this? I mean, I know that in the solid waste district, which I'm the town uh, representative to, there are some uh, embedded in the statute, there's some language that says if we ever wanted to not be in the district, we have to vote, and there are certain 
uh, ways that the town is involved for expansions and so on, but that's because the state requires us to manage our solid waste. So we have to do something. So we're connected to the municipality in a complicated way. There's no requirement here. So should we think of this as something of a technicality for the town to agree to it, or is that the wrong interpretation? No, I, I, I think this, that that's right. We're just essentially triggering the statute. The statute says if towns want to opt into this structure, this is what they have to do. There is a facility, if you want to leave the district, that there does have to be a vote, a similar vote, to exit. Um, it gets a little stickier if there has been investment in the town first and the town decides to leave um, because of the, in the investment of, of, of the district, but it's, it's pretty clear and it's not um, uh, onerous or anything like that. But no, we are not required to serve everyone in the district. That's something that we're just intending to do. Carl? Hi, this, uh, this does sound like a great idea. As somebody who uploads video, I, I like the <laughs> potential. Uh, so I have a couple questions. One, does this prevent um, in any way in the statute uh, free market competition of whatever charter cable coming in with fiber and giving it to Berlin cheaper in their locations? And is there a risk of cheaper market competition or technology making this uh, not worth doing. So I'll get, take your second one first. Um, is there a possibility of technology in the future making this uh, obsolete, essentially, if I'm hearing you right? And absent a crystal ball, I, I can't say for sure. Um, knowing what I know of the technology, everybody's <coughs> using fiber. It's, it's going to be fiber from here for, for a very, very long time. Um, when, you <clears throat> when somebody is building out the modern like 5G wireless architecture that's going to start being deployed around the nation. The eventual, the, the backhaul, essentially carrying that traffic somewhere, it's all done on fiber. So it's, it's been fiber for quite some time and I expect it's going to be fiber 10, 20 years into the future. Now will this prevent competition? No. No, it certainly won't. As a matter of fact, in a sort of an unfortunate turn, uh, in EC Fibers territory where they have a bunch of gigabit fiber to the home available, there are um, I'm trying to think, it was Fairpoint was taking a bunch of federal money and overbuilding, so building in places where the fiber was, overbuilding DSL, which, so for $10 cheaper, you can go from a gigabit down to eight megabits, right? Which doesn't exactly make sense, you know, why is use of our federal dollars and whatnot? But no, I mean, there's nothing preventing one of the, one of the big incumbents or another provider from coming in and building their own fiber or doing the, these other sorts of things, but given that they have not bothered to invest in that so far, I'm skeptical that that would ever happen. They have a lot of investment in the existing um, hardware, the actual routers, and the, uh, the copper, and the, the wire that they have already run on the poles here, um, and it would cost a lot for them to essentially tear that, all that stuff out and build, build new things on. Any other questions for Jeremy? Yes. Hi, my name is uh, J.C. Earl. I live on Darling Hill Road. Um, or Darling Road. I just want to make a comment real quick. I'm a real estate agent, and um, I've multiple occasions have had it, what Jeremy's talking about, people that wanted to live here in central Vermont, and they are moving to Vermont because they can work from home. And uh, I ended up selling them houses in Waterbury and Chittenden County because we can't support that. So between that and yes, I'd, I'd love to be able to stream a couple movies, but that's not the big deal to me. <laughs> the big deal is uh, we're not attracting the entrepreneurial businesses of the future. And for, for the vibrancy of central Vermont's economy, I think this is a, a huge slam dunk. So not much a, a question there, but a, a thank you for spearheading this. Hello, I'm I'm Sister Lorian, and I'm and I live off Vine Street. And uh, I was really excited to hear about this because uh, I had DSL for three months, and I had ten days service in those three months. So I went back to the telephone, uh, at, which is pretty reliable as long as no one sends me a picture. And I, 
I'd really like to be able to get some pictures occasionally, but I am a very occasional user. So when I heard $66 a month, I had sticker shock. And I'm wondering, are, can this include small users as well as giant users? And, and that's a question I've gotten before, and um, it, it can, at least initially though. Um, we have to build this out and sort of get, our, get on our own two feet before we would be able to look at cheaper options. The $66 a month is me sort of closing my eyes and imagining that we're an exact copy of EC Fiber. That's their price. If it turns out that we get 80% you know, of residences that the fiber passes, if we manage to get more people, the price will be cheaper. Because again, as, as this is a community-owned enterprise, the more people that we have, the more evenly that we can s essentially spread out the capital costs of, of building it in the first place. Uh, on the other hand, things could be more expensive if fewer people sign up. So it's kind of a, a chicken and the egg sort of thing. Would love to be able to, to provide cheaper service, but at least initially that's not, um, that's probably not on the cards in the first year or two. Hi, Jeremy. Josh Fitzhugh. Um, have you done any financial analysis to decide whether this business uh, makes sense for Central Vermont? So, yes, again, using, using the financials from EC Fiber, and all of their financials are public on their, on their site, ecfiber.net. So if you wanted to look at their last few years of, of revenues and expenditures, you can do that too. Um, the numbers that I'm working with is, um, and this is, a, this is a high number so, so that it's not, so that we're not surprised. The total cost, the total capital cost of building these, this network out is about $30,000 per mile. So per mile of town road that we run the fiber along. So in order to have that work, we need a density of six subscribers per mile of cable that we're running. And then, and then we can make, we can make the payments and it, it ends up working out. So if we have, if we're running it along 20 miles of road in, 20 miles of town roads in Berlin or Northfield or wherever, we would need roughly 120 subscribers to commit to doing this. And I can guarantee you the, the, the bond bank, when they look at the application to see whether they're going to fund something like this, they're, they're going to want to know that they have a good chance of, get, of getting their money back. And EC Fiber has actually done this with a, in a slightly, um, with slightly lower density, in part because they, some of the people that they've gotten to sign up, sign up for the, the higher tier service, the much faster service. Um, I'm happy to go a little bit farther into the weeds if you're, if you're so inclined in terms of the cost of you know, the um, house end devices or um, the actual process of how these things are, are constructed. Um, but if you have any more detailed questions, I can try to dive in more if you like. So I'm trying to determine how you, do, how you are going to find out whether there's a sufficient demand to justify the kind of infrastructure costs that you're talking about, because that's significant. Sure, which is why one of our first steps, and I sort of glossed over it, one of our, one, one of our first steps is to conduct a feasibility study. And that could be done formally by contracting that out with companies that do such things, um, or by simply uh, doing something more like what Granite City Grocery did, and just going and shaking the trees, knocking on doors, talking to neighbors, and getting people to commit to to joining this, you know, if you, it's not an if you build it, they will come. We have to make sure that they're going to come before we build it. Um, and getting people to commit either with, you know, in, in writing or by, you know, donating or lo loaning $100 or whatever it happens to be to guarantee that it makes sense in a certain area. And those areas, at least initially, that are more, um, the people are more kind of ravenous for this sort of connectivity are going to be the places where we start. Now, if, if a big business comes out, um, or a big landlord with businesses or tenants or whatever, if they say, I really want this to attract more people, more businesses to my uh, commercial properties or whatever, if they're willing to, to put down a stake and, and help us get going with this, then that can help things too. But yeah, the feasibility study and just finding where the, where the people are.
Good morning, Mike Streitzberg. Uh, a comment and then a question. Uh, comment, one of the things that stands out here, uh, even almost as much or more as the speed, is the privacy. Um, uh, I really like the idea of getting away from the monitoring and data collection that a commercial service will subject you to when you use uh, that type of service. So for that reason alone, I would support the concept. Uh, my question is, uh, I can see this being of huge benefit to schools, libraries, public institutions, um, and as a municipality, is there an agreement there? Would they get service at less or reduce or even no cost because it's a municipal service? That, that's a great question, and uh, EC Fiber does something very much what you're talking about, and I, I hope that we can du duplicate that as well. And what they do is, for schools and libraries, they offer the highest tier of service for the lowest price. So they essentially offer, for $66 a month, they offer 700 megabits per second, which is actually going up to a, a gigabit this year. So yes, there are those, those similar agreements, although you know, the, whatever the board decides, it could be, it could be different arrangements. It could be free, it could be otherwise subsidized. Sure. Hi, quick question. Um, Linda Moraboli, this is a terrific idea. Can you clarify what you mean by community owned? Like subscribers wouldn't become members or owners. I mean, does EC Fiber own this? Just a little clarification. Sure, so it's community owned in, in so far as that, in, in the same sense as you in a, in a sort of abstract way own the highway department trucks or the town offices. So you don't own it directly necessarily, but it is ultimately, the control of those assets ultimately devolves to the folks in the, in the member towns, because they have democratic you know, representatives on the board that if you, you know, if you have some issue and you want to change the way things work, you have the ability to change who those people are on, the, on that board. So similarly, you know, things that are you know, owned by the state or owned by the school district are in some indirect way also owned by the community, owned by us. Um, so because it's a municipality, it's not community owned in the same sense as a co-op where like at the Hunger Mountain Co-op, you're a member owner and you get like a dividend, ch dividend check at the end of the year or something like that. Could, could that structure be put into place once uh, once everything's built out and there's revenue left at the end of the year, sure. EC Fiber has, you know, mumbled about that possibility in, in the past in conversations that I've had with them, that when they have money left over at the end of the year, they write a check to the towns. So that's not something that they're doing, it's just something that they're, they're thinking about. Does, does that answer your question? Okay. Rob Griffin, uh, Richardson Road. Um, I'm assuming that one, since you mentioned adding Elmer potentially in the future, that one can add additional towns to an existing municipality. Why, why have you chosen the approach of building a new municipality rather than adding to EC Fiber? This is an easy one. EC Fiber didn't want it. <laughs> they have 24 towns and they're, and they're saying, stop. We're gonna build out all of our towns and get them set first. We're gonna build out everything in our member towns first. And then we can start thinking about, about the future. But that's, I mean, the, they're not gonna be done building out their member towns for another three or four years. So we could conceivably, we could conceivably wait three or four years until they're done and then, then petition to join. Um, but we're going to be low, low, low on the priority list. I could probably ask, uh, check this question uh, on the internet, but my, my internet speed is really slow, so I'll ask you so I, so I get the quick answer. Uh, EC Fiber, do they have an average installation uh, turnaround time from order to install for their, um, in their experience, and do they have uh, maintenance and customer service satisfaction rating at all that you know? So I'll start with your second question again first. Um, yeah, so if you've ever been on social media, you'll know that sometimes Facebook and Twitter can be a bit of a cesspool. I'm being totally generous here. <laughs> um, EC Fiber's Facebook page, on the other hand, if you check it out, is a 
It's like puppy dogs and rainbows. So everybody's like, wow, I just got hooked up. This is so great. This is amazing. I love my installer, all these things. And five star ratings across the board. And it's, it's, really, it's really impressive. And having visited their offices, um, they're really, really lean operation, but they do a terrific job with, with what they have. Um, I don't know the specific numbers for the, the turnaround time. I know that they do schedule these things uh, as far out as they can. So if there's somebody in Brookfield that wants to get hooked up and who um, you know, knows that they're on the construction route, they can, they can turn, it around, turn it around pretty quickly. Um, once, the, once the infrastructure is there, yeah, I mean, I, I have to imagine it would be within a couple of weeks. I mean, if, if you're not in part of the original build out. But they get, they get super high marks in terms of customer service and, uh, and their like, call center, essentially. Tech support, that's what I was looking for. Uh, Bob Warnick. Uh, does the town voters get another bite of the apple? In other words, once this concept is approved today, uh, will there four bond votes, or how does that work, or is this it? This is pretty much it. Um, so this al essentially allows us to create the district. The town could have another bite at the apple if they decided to leave the district. That would be the other vote that's there. Um, the bond votes, because it's insulated from the town, um, the bond votes, um, as far when I'm, if I'm reading the statute correctly and I'm reading how EC Fiber is doing it, that's managed by their board. That's not, that's not brought to a, um, to a town by town vote for each of the bonding opportunities that, that go forth from there. I hope you weren't going to take take your town reports and start throwing them at me. But I'm an old geezer, an old crony, that goes to Dunkin' Donuts, and we solve the world's problems each night. Well. This will eventually come true. Who knows how many town meetings down the road, but it will eventually come true. But in getting, weeping your rewards, we're also going to bring penalties. And penalties is, this whole area is not going to be the same anymore. Now, I live on Scott Hill Road. A, paper, a piece of property front, across from me, that wide open land, a farmland. Oh, these people from New York and Detroit, Los Angeles, Miami, that want a place, a summer home or a winter home, that farm will be cut up like a jigsaw puzzle because it's gonna be worth money. And you spoke about it earlier uh, this morning how someone is gonna come and say, do I have access to, oh, I'm sorry. Well, that same person comes back and finds out he does. Oh, they're gonna be all kinds of people going after properties. And the farms that you used to see, oh, they're gonna start falling by the byway because that property is worth so much more. To cut that up and I drive around Vermont to just discover Vermont, even though I've lived here my whole, my whole life. Go down to Sharon and go up on them back roads and find already find farmlands that are gone. Go up onto Spear Street outside of Burlington where you overlook Lake Champlain. What used to be farmlands? It's nothing but houses and houses and houses. Well, you can start throwing your books at me now or later, but of course, this will come to pass sooner or later. Just an old geezer or an old crony, not at Dunkin' Donuts, but at town meeting. Thanks very much, and I'll, I'll, I'll be short in my response to that. I, I don't think that this is an either or sort of thing. I mean, I think that farms and modern forestry and agriculture can coexist with modern internet infrastructure as well. Um, I think the, the place for us to put our efforts into thinking about how we want our town to grow and how we want to preserve farmland and direct the way that we want development to go is through 
our planning commission. We're in the process of updating our town plan, which has a lot. It's, it's, a, it's a big plan, and it has a lot to do with how we imagine Berlin looking in 10 years. And uh, that's um, from the planning commission. Bob, Bob do you, that, that plan hasn't been approved yet. We're still, we're still working on that, right? OK, so that's, that's still in, in progress. So um, we have the opportunity to say we don't want the farms to be divvied up. We don't want um, the large blocks of land to be split up and sold into residential developments. We, we have that opportunity as residents. And I, I totally hear what you're saying. I, I'm still of the personal opinion that we can coexist both and, not, not either or. But that's just me. And I'll have to meet you at Dunkin' Donuts sometime <laughs> to continue. A question in the front. Uh, John Friedrich, uh, Chase uh, Brook Road, or at least uh, that's what it said on my uh, deed, but I think they renamed it Chase Road. Anyway, uh, the end of the road, and so very slow internet. But nevertheless, um, two lines bonded together do a little bit better. Uh, I am one of those people who came in from Texas, settled here, and planned to die here, and uh, uh, love it up here. Um, vice president of a software development company. So it is very important to have decent internet, and I'm fighting it all the time. And if I weren't part owner, I probably could not convince the rest of people to, <laughs> to, uh, to allow me to live here. Um, so I think there's huge opportunities for this. But the other thing I was going to say is, uh, you're looking for money then. Uh, also, I want to I wanna support it with that, too. So uh, uh, count me in. Uh, Matthew Polk on Bartlett Hill Road. I just wanted to clarify that this public utility district is uh, would be accountable to the people in local towns here, whereas uh, those of us who may have Verizon or Charter or something right now, those, util those utilities are uh, corporately owned and they're accountable to that corporation. Is that correct? That, that is true, and it, and it turns out actually that internet service is not regulated the same way as telephone service and uh, cable TV, so if you have an outage on your phone, if you can't get your phone service for a certain amount of time, the phone company is required to reimburse you for those, those times that you were out. Internet service, though, is not the same. So if you have an outage or you don't get the speed that was advertised to you, they say, oh, sorry. And that's all you get. There's no, um, there's very little, I don't say no accountability, but there's very little accountability from the, the larger companies. You would, you would at least have the ability then to call tech support in central Vermont or call your board member here in central Vermont and complain directly to them or have, you know, have lunch with them at Dunkin' Donuts and let them know what's what. It's, and that's not something that you can do with your average you know, Comcast VP or uh, network engineer. Any more questions? Yes. Uh, my name is Steve Bushman. I live on Chase Road, but on the Jonesbrook side. And Jonesbrook Road, as some people know, it starts in Berlin, goes into Moortown, and then goes back into Berlin. So my first question is, are we going to be not able to get service because they would have to string line through Moortown and not able to offer service to the Moortown people that live on that road? And my second question is, I understand the subscriber cost if we elected to, to join and, and to get service. But the bonding costs, I'm a little bit confused about. If, if the community joins this, if they, if they create this, does every household get assessed a, a fee for the bond amount, or how does that work? Because this is a different kind of a bond, sorry, because this is a different kind of a bond than the bonds, like, like I said, to renovate the school, this is a revenue bond, so no, people who are not signed up for the service don't get charged. There's no additional assessment on your property taxes. There's no additional fee that gets snuck in anywhere else. Essentially what happens is when you get a bill at the end of the month and it says it's $66 or it's $100 or whatever tier you've chosen, you pay that. And the, we would use that then to, to pay the bond. And that's, and that's it. Um, the question about Moortown is a good one. And one of the reasons I was, I was happy to talk to 
um, the Moortown Select Board. And actually, one of the Moortown Select Board members works for the town of Berlin, so I had, had a quick in. Um, but no, they're, they're interested too because a lot of the folks that in, in Moortown that are underserved are actually on the eastern reaches of the town that border Berlin. So there are other folks right down the street from you in Moortown who want this service too. Um, and it might make sense for us to, to run one of our you know, main one of our main lines right past your house to feed more town. Um, I haven't looked at the, the geography of it of it in depth, but that's one thing that I that I did consider at least as I'm looking at the maps and where people are not covered. So even if more town decides not to come in, though, we still have the ability to go through segments of non-member towns to serve members um, to serve member towns. It's it's gonna it's gonna come down to the to the the calculus of how many miles of roads we're talking about, and if if you and a whole bunch of Berlin neighbors are are, are there, or on average, however many people we, we have in the member towns, if it's far above our target of um, six subscribers per linear mile, then we can probably more easily stretch out into those places that are that are a bit more rural, that are a bit more hard to reach. Um, but that requires some smart initial investment so that we have the, the wiggle room to, to go and branch out to those places eventually. I'll remind you we're on Article 27, which reads, shall the town of Berlin enter into a communications union district to be known as the Central Vermont Internet under provisions of 30 VSA Chapter 82? Are you ready for that question? If so, all in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. It passes unanimously. Article 28, the final article to discuss any other business that may legally come before the meeting is by law intended to prevent binding articles, but non-binding referenda or questions or announcements are completely available. And who would like to speak first? Thank you, Tor Nelson, Chair of the Select Board. Uh, usually we take this time to have a quick update from the uh, State Legislature's uh, representative. Lewis is not able to be with us today and sends her regrets, but we are privileged to have Representative Ann Donahue with us today. I'd like to give her a moment to uh, give an update on what's going on in the Legislature. Thanks very much for a few minutes of your time, and I, um, I will stay on after the meeting. So if anybody has questions or input or thoughts you want to share, um, I'll be here to hear them. Um, but I did want to give just a brief update on probably what's the most important issue we're dealing with this year, and that is reconfiguring the whole uh, tax structure, um, both income tax and uh, property tax in terms of the education tax. Um, and there's been a fair amount of talk about one of those pieces, and that's the education tax. Um, but sort of at the last minute last week, the proposals that were being discussed um, were taken off the table, and a new proposal um, was passed by the House Ways and Means Committee that also incorporated um, a restructuring of the income tax system for Vermont. Um, so that'll be coming up before the House, and then it goes over to the Senate. But basically what it includes, it puts them all together in one bill, uh, and it has three, three main pieces. Um, first of all, for those who weren't aware, the federal tax change, Vermont's income tax currently is directly tied to the federal tax. And so the, um, the result of the federal tax changes, if we did nothing as a state, um, it'd be awesome because the state coffers would grow by $30 million and we wouldn't even have to raise taxes. We'd just have all that new money to spend, which I think would be sort of cheating, It'd be like a secret tax increase. Um, so nobody wants to do that. Um, so the first part of this bill would be coming up with a mechanism to change the income tax structure so that the, uh, the state coffers do not surreptitiously benefit from that. Um, it's a little tricky to make it exactly precise that um, no one has a change in their state tax because it's not really a one-for-one, one, but they've tried to align it so that everybody would be sort of held harmless and it wouldn't change uh, what you'd be paying in state taxes. 
But another aspect to it, which would obviously affect other taxpayers because there's so much money, if it's not coming out of one pocket, it's coming out of somebody else's. Um, the proposal does incorporate um, a, uh, a tax relief on Social Security benefits. Uh, so that for uh, 45,000 for single filers, 60,000 for um, uh, two, two member filers uh, would not be taxed um, for state income tax. That puts us in the same place as lots of other states. We're one of the very few, if not the only remaining state, that still taxes uh, social, all Social Security benefits. Uh, so that would be a part of it, um, rolled out immediately in one year rather than over several years because there's sort of some money to play with um, because of the federal tax changes. Play with meaning your money, but um, that's what happens in the political process. Um, and then tied to that in the same bill rather than separately is this whole uh, uh, new structure for uh, the education tax. The proposal that got a lot of publicity and a lot of attention was one that would reduce property taxes, the education component, by roughly 25 percent and shifting to making that up through an income tax surcharge, uh, specifically identified as a separate line on the income uh, tax. That has been rejected um, as they couldn't figure out a way to do it that would sort of hold people harmless in terms of not increasing what uh, some middle or lower income people might pay in some categories, not in, in all. So the new proposal actually would reduce property taxes by approximately 10 percent um, and would still shift that to an income tax a surcharge. And the proposal right now is it would be uh, 0.1 percent on lowest brackets. 0.5% for middle brackets and 1% on highest income brackets. Um, we haven't had, I got a one page handout the day before we left for town meeting break. We have not had a whole drill down, so I can't tell you, for instance, what, what constitute those brackets that are being discussed. Um, this is really just a, a big picture. Um, the rest of it really is just shifting money around to make it a little more direct. Instead of a general fund transfer into the education fund, there'd be a rerouting of 100 percent of the sales tax instead of just uh, one penny on the sales tax going to the education fund instead of that general sales tax, and also 25 percent of the, of the rooms and meals tax. So that's just kind of shuffling money around. That doesn't have a, a direct um, impact on um, on the taxes you pay, it's just the, the rooting of them. Um, so that's the, you know, that's the big picture. Um, it would eliminate the excess spending penalty that in the system currently, uh, but more directly tie the increase in that property tax to local district uh, spending decisions. Um, so uh, it doesn't come with a direct. Uh, um, cost reduction plan as a part of it, but the idea is if it's more directly tied, people will be more conscious. It does not eliminate the um, income sensitivity. Uh, the original proposal was going to eliminate the income sensitivity because enough of it would be being paid by the income tax surcharge that low income folks wouldn't be paying the income tax surcharge, and that would have taken, that would have replaced the income sensitivity provision for low income folks. But now that it's not shifting as much, um, the income sensitivity piece stays in. So the goal of kind of reducing the complexity <laughs> sort of isn't really happening because it's keeping much more of the existing system in place. So that's the, the broad overview. I can try to. Uh, answer questions offline or as I get more information, um, pass it on in, in my updates um, that you can get by email or I try to um, give at least abbreviated versions on uh, Front Porch Forum. So thanks very much. Thanks, Sam. Uh, Tour Nelson is finishing up as chair of the select board. I'd invite you to join me in thanking him. Uh, 
Uh, there was an announcement from a lady from the Unitarian Church, I know. Come right up to the microphone here. Thank you. I'm Sally Chartrand, Berlin Church. We are going to be having a soup, sandwich, dessert luncheon on Saturday at noon. And uh, <coughs> we're going to be, also we're going to have chili. And uh, we are kind of short on reservations. And if anybody would like to come, it's $7 per person. And thank you. Thank you. Anyone else have an announcement or anything to say? Sure. I guess that's my last act as the uh, chairman being on the select board. Uh, I'd like to thank the town staff that we have. It's really made my job uh, a lot easier over the years, and I'm sure the select board uh, agrees with me. We've uh, got a great staff in place, uh, but we do have a few changes during the year, uh, as we do every year. Uh, Mary Whistle retired uh, from the uh, Sewer Commission. Uh, she's been there for several years and, and often enjoying her retirement. Uh, her duties were kind of absorbed by uh, Tom Badowski, uh, who's now splitting his time between the Water and Sewer Departments and the uh, Zoning Department. Uh, also on the Police Department, uh, we had a couple police officers leave during the year. Uh, Carrie Tucker, Kevin Blanchard, and William Pine, uh, they all left to pursue other endeavors. Uh, but we did add a few uh, police officers during the year. We added uh, Ben Cavaretta, who came to us from Hardwick Police Department, and Officer Stephen Tiersch uh, came to us. Uh, Stephen's in the back. Uh, he's the one with, uh, with more hair than the, than the other. Uh, everybody, uh, feel free to make your way back there and welcome him to uh, Berlin. Thank you. Anything else? Hello, I'm Pat Barbera. I live off Hill Street Extension. And just a couple of comments. I'd like to thank the Highway Department for the wonderful job they've done all winter. Um, when I'm safe and warm in my bed and those plows go by on my country road, I, I just say how fortunate I am that I live in the town of Berlin. And I also would like to thank the police department who helped me out with the nuisance problem that I had. And they were very responsive to me and I'm very indebted to them. I noticed in the town report that they're encouraging the use of surveillance cameras on our property. And I might put in a request that maybe the town could do a workshop for those of us that are technologically challenged on how to set up these surveillance cameras on our property to help ourselves and our neighbors. And maybe it could be on, on the website or maybe at a town hall, at a town meeting whatever but anyway I think it's a great idea thank you thank you Corinne Hey there, Corinne Stridesburg. Just a few announcements. I want to make sure people know that the PTNA is having a seed fundraiser out in the lobby. Um, it's high mowing seats. Um, you're not actually getting them, you're ordering them. Check your cash. Also, out in the lobby, we have some Girl Scout cookies for sale that we have in the last few years. Uh, Historical Society has a display out there. We hope you'll take a look. There's both some stuff on poster boards and a couple of interesting binders. Also, the Historical Society this year's potluck meeting will be, well, potluck presentation, I should say, will be Wednesday, May 16th, over at the Congregational Church. And it will be Sally Chartrand and David Perrin who will be giving some history of the church. We have some other meetings lined up. They're on the screen paper out in the lobby. Uh, dog licenses are due on or before April 1st. It's $9 if they're spayed and neutered, 13 if not. And one other thing to mention, I haven't seen many of you at the Capital City Grange. The first Saturday of the month, they have a potluck. It's great, 6 p.m. first Saturday. Who doesn't like potluck? Anything else with town meeting, Chairman? 
Uh, Corinne just r reminded me too uh, about the Grange. Um, the Grange offers all residents of Berlin the, uh, the opportunity to use their facilities for free. So if you want to have a birthday party or a wedding or um, host your favorite punk rock band or something like that, um, you can call and schedule a time to use the Grange and they, because they're in Berlin and they're thanking us for the tax abatement that we gave them a few years ago, um, you can use their facilities for free. So keep that in mind. Good. Uh, we're about to end town meeting. Unless there's something else, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. Sir. And second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. We're going to start the school district meeting in just a minute when we change boards so you can stretch your feet. And the first order of business, Article 1, to elect a moderator for the year ensuing. Is there, are there any nominations? Okay. Here. Right. Are there any other nominations? Uh, hearing none, all in favor of Paul Gillies as the town school district moderator indicate by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed? Nay. Okay. Paul Gillies is elected to the town school district moderator. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. The uh, Article 2, as, as before, to hear an act upon the report of the town school directors. This booklet contains that report on pages uh, 4 and 5. Are there any questions off the top for the uh, school uh, board? You can uh, reserve your questions about the budget until we get to that article, if you like. But anything else? Uh, then there's the uh, school principal's annual report. The budget, salary and benefit protection, pages 11 or 13. Uh, estimated tax calculations, and the rest of it is U32. Uh, any other que any questions at all about the school report? Article 3, shall the school district authorize the Board of School Directors to hold any audited fund balance as of June 30th, 2018, in a reserve fund to be expended under the control and direction of the Board of School Directors for the purpose of operating the school. Who will bring this article before us so we may discuss it? So, Bob. And second? Mike. Uh, this is a perennial article. It's uh, usually explained as if we vote it down, then we have to send the surplus back to the state. So you're torn between your obligations to the state and to the town school district. So any discussion on this? Are you ready for that question? Yes. Shall the school district authorize the Board of School Directors to hold any audited fund balance as of June 30th, 2018 in a reserve fund to be expended under the control and direction of the Board of School Directors for the purpose of operating a school? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. The motion passes. Article 4, shall the school district authorize the board of school directors to borrow money in anticipation of the receipt of revenues for the 2018-2019 school year? Who will bring that article before us? Sir, and second? Somebody. Good. Uh, Discussion. This is uh, again a perennial article, and allows for uh, you know coverage of uh, of uh, having adequate cash to cover the school district's needs. Are you ready for that question? Shall the school district authorize the board of school directors to borrow money in anticipation of the receipt of revenues for the 2018-2019 school year? All in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed say no. Article passes. Uh, the uh, our, uh, state law was changed a few years ago and allows us to discuss articles that are being voted on by Australian ballot in this meeting. And I believe there is a presentation of the school budget if no one has any objections. So, uh, uh, Carl. Thank you. 
So there are a couple of presentation videos. First, we have a slideshow about Berlin Elementary School that the technical and uh, technical and library staff put together for us. So uh, we'll go through the slideshow if there's no objection to let you meet some of the student uh, staff members here at Berlin Elementary School. And then we'll go ahead with a YouTube video, which you may have already seen. Uh, there, it was linked on, on Front Porch Forum and other media outlets here in central Vermont. Uh, but then we'll go ahead with that YouTube, which does explain the budget. So this is our new staff members, Austin Jacobs, the chef, and Kate Liptek, our new music teacher. This is the fourth, fifth, and sixth grade teaching staff team. The third and fourth grade team. The first and second grade team and our kindergarten team here at Berlin Elementary. And these are our paraprofessional staff and our specials staff. Pardon? That's our pre-K. That's our oh, pre-K, sorry. Uh, and these are our specialists, our interventionists that help with uh, um, extra help with reading focus and mathematics. Our special education team here at Berlin. And some behavior interventionalists here at Berlin. And, our, and this is a crew that we can certainly thank today. They helped us get everything ready uh, today, so please thank uh, Chuck, Jeff, and Stephen, our maintenance department here at Berlin Elementary. And this is the administrative staff, our office staff, and our school nurse. Now, this is a photo of some of our math outreach and, and special projects that the kids are working on. This is our STEAM, which is science, technology, uh, engineering, arts, and math. Thank you. <laughs> some of the projects that our third and fourth grade classes are working on. And uh, this is the writer arts, I can't read that. <laughs> Their winter concert. Thank you. We did have a music day and uh, here's grades one and two perform, uh, with some of their projects. Our kindergarten art extension pro projects. Uh, farm to School, which incidentally will be on the next school board agenda at the end of March at U32. If anyone's interested to find out more about that, the Farm to School program will be coming to the board meeting and giving a presentation to, uh, to help us learn more about that. This is a field trip the students took, gleaning apples, and I think it was at the VTC. Uh, apple Orchard. Some more farm to school projects. Outdoor learning activities. For one and two. And getting kids involved in science in a way they may not necessarily fear it is always a good thing, so it's great that we are uh, using nature to help the kids here at Berlin Elementary. We did have a robotics team and the Junior Iron Chef project as well. This is uh, PBIS bill, stands for? Positive Behavior Intervention, <laughs> Intervention Support. And uh, it has uh, is, is been great here at Berlin Elementary. We've had a lot of data um, showing that uh, behavior has improved over the last few years here at Berlin, which makes for a, a better learning environment for all students. So. Okay. So, Here's our winter celebration.
every maker space. Okay. I'd like to thank our technology staff here at uh, Berlin Elementary for putting that slideshow together. And there will be uh, also a presentation about the budget. Uh, while Bill gets that ready, I just want to say um, last year we did have the bond go through and a lot of improvements were made to the school. As a coach here at Berlin, I think you're standing on one of the things I'm most proud of as a, as a fifth, sixth basketball coach here. The kids fell and they had a spongy rubber surface to stand on instead of the hard tile. So just one of the many things, our new gym floor, a lot of painting, the great lighting here, the flooring you've seen out in the lobby, the heating, the ventilation systems were improved, the, um, the lighting in the learning center, the organization of the cubbies. So there's so much that was done. So again, a year later, this, is, this may be the first opportunity some of you have to come in and see what our positive vote on the school bond has done for the learning environment here at Berlin Elementary School. So if this is the first time you've seen it or you haven't seen a board member, community member, or school member, or somebody involved in the school, I want to say thank you for supporting that. And you're just seeing a few of the great things that we were able to do to improve uh, what is Berlin's largest and greatest community asset, this, this school building. Uh, so with that, I think the Berlin Elementary School budget uh, YouTube will come up. Hopefully we have the sound, and uh, I'll take questions afterwards if you do have any about this presentation. Thank you for taking a moment of your time for this Berlin Elementary School proposed budget presentation for the years 2018-2019. Within this presentation, we'll be talking about the budgeting process, the components of the 2018-2019 Berlin Elementary School budget, and the factors that impact the tax rate for Berlin taxpayers, the local budgets, the state tax rate, the property yield, and the common level of appraisal. When creating a budget, there are several competing pressures, as you see in this diagram below. First of all, curriculum decisions, the teachers and staff contracts, economic pressures, educational quality is the foundation of all our decisions as school board members, political pressures, revenue projections, federal mandates and benefits, and of course the tax burden and student test, test scores. When developing the Berlin Elementary School budget, there is a system and sequence. First of all, the principal and superintendent and business administrator for WCSU with staff input come up with budget draft scenarios. That budget draft scenario was presented to the school board for review and commentary. The school board makes determinations and evaluates those budget scenarios deciding things such as should we add staff, should we cut staff, should we change programs, and the Berlin Elementary School Board holds open meetings and community forums for community input on the budgets. Once a budget draft is approved by the school board, it is then presented to the town of Berlin for voter approval. The proposed budget for the 2018-2019 fiscal year is $3,510,918. That's a total expense change of 1.74% increase. The net impact on taxes is 1.86%. The proposed budget educational spending per equalized pupil is down 3.51% this year. In 2017 and 2018, our per equalized pupil spending was $17,507. It's now $16,892. You can see in the graphs below the percentage of expense change in each budget category. You will notice that there is an increase in WCSU assessments. Those assessments were transfers from 
The decrease you'll see in the orange pie segment in special education. The special education budget was moved from the districts to the supervisory union level. Here are some of the budget change highlights for the 2018-2019 budget. There was a new teacher's contract negotiated and the total salary increases were well below the CPI or the community uh, or the consumer price index for this year. The salary increases were $57,222. The benefit changes decreased by $17,921 total. So the total negotiated items is an increase of 1.14%. Non-salary items increased by $20,618, 0.6%. The combined total is a budget increase of $59,919, or 1.74% increase. Our revenues decreased by $4,351, or a 0.13% decrease. The net impact on taxes is $64,270, or a 1.86% budget change. Berlin Elementary School enrollment stayed relatively consistent this year for 2017 and 18. The school year pre-K through 6 enrollment is 217, whereas the 2016-2017 was 220. Our pre-K enrollment is expected to be level and consistent over the next five years. In this chart, you can take a look at the other districts around WCSU and see what they pay per equalized pupil. You can see East Montpelier, Middlesex, Worcester, and U32 all have higher per equalized pupil spending than Berlin. Here's the percentage change for proposed budgets and the net impact on taxes for the towns around WCSU. Berlin's 1.74% increase was below all of the towns and districts within WCSU except for Callis. Callis has three kindergartners coming in and they decreased by a one full-time educator. So they cut a teacher this year for that budget decrease. If you'll note at the bottom as well, this change and impact on taxes also inclu includes the 3.28% special education and transportation increase. There are four factors that affect the local tax rate. The common level of appraisal, the statewide education tax rate, the property yield, which is a new feature of the education funding system, and the Berlin Elementary and U32 school budgets. The Berlin Elementary School and the U32 High School Board of Directors only have impact on the fourth item. The only thing we can control is our elementary and high school budgets. Here's an explanation of what the common level of appraisal is. The common level of appraisal is an adjustment, adjustment to the education tax rate to account for the gap between the appraised value within the town of Berlin properties and the actual value of the property. In 2018 and 2019, the common level of appraisal for Berlin is factored in at 102.45%. That's a negative 3.39% change from last year's 105.84%. This will result in a tax increase of 5.5 cents. The statewide tax rate, the residential tax rate, will stay the same as last year, $1. And to explain the property yield, this represents the amount of revenue raised by $1 base homestead property tax rate. The property yield is projected to decrease 
by $318 from $10,160 to $9,842, which results in a tax rate increase of 5.5 cents. Once again, the property yield is set by the state of Vermont. The total amount of revenue they receive from property tax going into the education fund is divided uh, amongst the school districts in the state. The changes in the CLA and the property yield total 11 cent tax rate increased. The proposed budgets at Berlin Elementary and the Town of Berlin share of U32 have a very minor impact on the increase in the Berlin tax rate. The non-residential tax rate is projected to re increase in Berlin from 0.079, or from 1.55 to $1.62.9. This combined with the change in CLA results in a tax increase of 14 cents. These rates do not reflect income sensitivity adjustments, which are available to most homeowners with incomes less than $137,500 a year. You can look now at the tax rate impacts for 2018 and 2019 for the districts throughout WCSU. Berlin at 11 cents. Callis, who uh, cut a teacher this year, is at 0.068 cents. 0.094 for East Montpelier, 0.039 for Middlesex, and 0.163 for Worcester. It's estimated that 56% of Berlin residents receive support for their property taxes from income sensitivity. 44% of Berlin residents pay the full tax rate. This graph below will show you the amount of, that Berlin receives in adjusted property tax rates. To summarize this year's Berlin Elementary School budget, we are proposing a budget of $3,510,918. This proposed budget is a 1.74% increase over last year's budget. I think it's very important to note that we as a school board elected not to hire a full-time educator this year. It was a very difficult decision, but we were very sensitive to taxpayers, to property tax impacts, while at the same time keeping in mind that we wanted the best education for Berlin Elementary School, uh, school students as possible. So the passage of both the Berlin Elementary School and U32 budgets will result in 11 cent increase in the local homestead tax rate. This translates into an increase of $110 per $100,000 of assessed property value. Our tax rate is projected to increase due to the change of the common level of appraisal and the statewide education tax formula. We, the Berlin Elementary School Board, believe this is a responsible budget balancing fiscal, fiscal constraint with student needs. We ask your, for your support. We also invite you to the public hearing, which will be held at Berlin Elementary School on Monday, March 5th, 2018 at 6 p.m. We be well, you missed that. <laughs> that was yesterday. We did have a good meeting, and uh, we had a lot of folks show up and, and participate. So I'm thankful for those people who came to that meeting to find out more about the Berlin budget, and I'm thankful for each of you uh, for being here today as well. Uh, I would, at this time, there's just a couple quick things I did want to mention uh, that the 11 cent tax rate, uh, the 11 cent tax increase uh, this year, uh, 5.3 cents of that is because of the Berlin elementary budget and 5.7 cents of that is the U32 budget. So those are two separate votes on your ballot if, if you haven't filled it out yet. So I did want to make that distinction as well, although I know as, as board members, we support U32 and, and making sure they give a, a 
and excellent education to Berlin students that go there and Berlin Elementary. We actually only, only had input on the Berlin Elementary budget and, and not on the U32 budget. Uh, does anyone have any questions they'd like to ask specifically? Uh, would you like to? No, no, please do. Okay. Any questions that they'd like to ask specifically ab about the budget, the presentation? Actually, let, let's get you the mic so uh, Orca can hear you. Diane Nichols Fleming. Um, on CAX last night, they were mentioning something from Brad James saying that there might be a shift again in the state percentages. Have you heard anything about that? It sounded like it was a potentially positive move for schools, but I didn't know if anything had been said. I haven't heard about it, so I probably shouldn't comment, but uh, the superintendent of WCSU, uh, Bill Kimball, is here, and if, if you'd like him to try to answer that, does he need to get permission, Paul? Who would object to his talking at this meeting? Anyone? Bill? Thanks, Diane. Um, the board developed this budget and uh, recommended it to the community back in January. They did it through November and December. All the tax ex estimations that you see were from December 1st on. Um, since then, budgets have come in around the state. There was an estimation at December 1st that school budgets would increase at about 3 to 3.5 percent. It looks like with a very preliminary survey, I don't want to say it's, it's tight there, Diane, um, that it looks like the estimated change for school budgets around the state of Vermont, average is around 2.5%. If the Berlin community or U32 weren't to change their budget at all, you, your taxes still can be affected by what other communities in the state of Vermont have. That's a long, complicated discussion, but you should know that your taxes are not only driven, as Carl pointed out in the video, by what happens here, but what happens in every other town in the state today. Yes. I just wanted to thank the school board and for the work of this community. Our school is an excellent school. It has served our children well, and it continues to serve the children of Berlin very well, U32 as well. Um, there are not only pressures on our financials, there are pressures on you as a school board as to what to consider, and I appreciate that you put our kids at the center of it, and that we as a community, as a society, as a state need to not balance um, the struggles on our children, but to continue to provide the best quality public education we can, because that's the great equalizer for all of us. So thank you for your work. Thank you. Yes. Hi, Susan Wilson, Partridge Road, uh, Point, Ridge, Point Ridge Road, Partridge Farms. Um, so I also wanted to thank you. Uh, I'm sort of a recent, you know, seven year recent, but recent uh, resident of central Vermont and, and Berlin the last four years. Um, and I'm part of a group called Reading Den Racism. And I just want to say thank you to uh, Washington um, County Central Schools, uh, primarily because we've had very successful readings uh, within central Vermont. And uh, we will be reading in Berlin actually on Friday. And we're just delighted that uh, the reception from the teachers and the students, uh, it's a volunteer group, uh, but again, it speaks to the quality of uh, the community here and the reception and the importance of cultural competence. Thanks. Well, thank you for that program and thank you for coming to Berlin to, to offer that service and, and outreach and educational opportunity. We appreciate that. And that might be a great segue and opportunity to say there are a lot of volunteer opportunities here at Berlin Elementary for community members. You don't necessarily have to have a child here at Berlin Elementary to p help participate. You could come read there, uh, to students. There are coaching, refereeing opportunities here. Uh, there are so many things that you can do to help out as a community member, a parent, a grandparent, or just a friend. The PTNA is very active. 
uh, the Parent Teacher Neighbor Association here at Berlin Elementary, and they're always looking for folks that are interested in giving back to the community, helping out with the school to participate here at Berlin. And yes, you had a comment or question. I saw a segment on Channel 3 News that was very, very upsetting. Uh, I've known school bus drivers, different ones throughout the years, and they tell me about situations of vehicles running buses. But I didn't realize how out of control it had got when they talked about how many buses, cars, they just don't care. And I'm wondering how, how many reports in Berlin and Union 32 do you have that uh, someone's child may not be coming home tonight because of a careless driver? Do you have any input on how many school buses get run every day by a careless driver? I don't, I don't know if there's any data, but Bill, would you have any numbers on any reported incidents of I, that I nature? We, we track that with our busing contractor for a student, um, and they report it right away to the state police. The drivers usually get a license plate that makes the car and turn that in. Um, but I haven't heard of one in a while, and usually my transportation coordinator lets me know when that happens. Yeah. Any other questions? Thank you, Carl. <clears throat> We're on Article 5, the uh, other business article to transact any other business that may legally come before the meeting. Are there any announcements that should be made? Uh, I have the traditional announcement about the lunch, which is available here for $5. Egg salad, ham salad, tuna salad, corn chowder or minestrone, and uh, pudding, $5. Anything else? I'll accept a motion to adjourn this school district meeting. So and second, all in favor of the adjournment, say aye. 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 Those opposed, no. You are adjourned. Thank you.